Sorry, Mom. The drive-by hello was wonderful. So many people came by. It was great. We appreciate you so much. There's not a church like Valley View any. Love you guys. Love you. Love y'all. Love y'all. Thank Love you. you. Happy Mother's Day. This is usually an extra special, wonderful, exciting, and enthusiastic day for us as, as kids often come back, come into town to visit mom and honor her and come to church with her. And some people who even haven't been to church in a while, you know, decide I'm going to come back and go to church with mom and it fills the pews and we've got better singing and, and we look forward to this every year. And yet we're reminded once again that things are just not normal. And while you have it this way, um, we're just going to adapt the best that we can. And the greetings that you're going to see in a few moments from different people, several of them are going to include some, some appreciations and some shout outs to mom. We've done that on purpose just to give you a little bit of a feel of Mother's Day when everything is kind of out of sorts. Uh, it's a great thing to do. And one particular family I, I went after uh, was a family we have four generations of every time we assemble here at Valley View. So uh, Juliet and Jet uh, share what they appreciate about Amy Jones, their mom. And then Amy then gets to talk about what she appreciates about her mom. Dustin is not in the picture at all. And that's not because of Mother's Day. He was copping an attitude uh, while I was there and we had to set him in time out. And I relished doing that. What a weird guy. If you need lawyer help, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, um, she shared, shared some things about Cindy, and then we caught Charles, and Charles was willing to share some things about Eulalia, which means we've got four generations of people here, and I think it's a beautiful thing, and you're going to see that with these greetings in just a moment. I also want uh, to say uh, how we're mindful of Autumn Kirtner, and she buried her dad this past week, and that's just a, a terrible thing for anybody, and, um, and we just want to let her know that we're thinking about her. And then I want to share a couple of pictures. I'm just going to do some shameless, selfish stuff here. Um, I, I have in my hands up here a, a manuscript. It is a manuscript of a sermon that was presented on Mother's Day, 1985. It was done by a typewriter. And for those of you who don't know, a typewriter is you push this button with a letter on it, and this arm comes up and strikes the paper and produces that letter on the paper. It's tedious now. But that's how it used to be done all the time. And so uh, it's a sermon on prayer, typewritten, two pages. My mom wrote it for me. I delivered my first sermon ever in front of my home church on Mother's Day, 1985, making it 35 years ago. Uh, mom was down there and she, was, she knew all the words I was supposed to say, so she was making sure I did it right. But my dad was taking pictures. And I hunted up a couple of those pictures and you're going to see them on the screen. It's kind of grainy. I mean, it's 1985, but at least it's color. Anyway, so uh, it, I just want you to see those, and I want to shout out to my mom, one of the most heroic mothers, a great mother, and uh, I just got to shout out to her. I appreciate her. I'm proud of her as a lady, and I also want to say, uh, if there's anybody watching who, who are willing to do this, I'm going to give you her phone number. Would you please text her and say, you've got a great son. Happy Mother's Day, 573-561-4631. It'll make her day. Anyway, happy Mother's Day, Mom. And I remember 35 years ago, I was terrified, but she did a great sermon back then. Anyway, so enjoy the greetings. And then what you're going to find is Camden, Camden, Camden Hawkum will be leading the song. And then Daniel Timms will have our scripture reading from James chapter 5. And we will sing Jesus Loves Me together. Hello, my name is Bill Berry. If anybody don't know me, and I'll say hello to all the people in Valley View. And I hope this is over soon so we can all get back together. Bless all of you. Hello, Valley View family. This is uh, the Eastons. I'm Michael. We've got Becky, Annabelle, and Carter, who <laughs> thinks he has to have a power drill with him everywhere he goes. Uh, we just wanted to say, tell everybody that we missed them and that uh, we're looking forward to getting back in whenever it's safe. Definitely want to wait till it's safe, but we're, uh, we're excited to see everyone again. What do you miss about it, Annabelle? I miss that on Wednesday nights that we go, and I miss if we switch teachers and I get to go see if um, 
be if I get a new teacher and I get it, I like <coughs> what new teacher I get. Yeah. Well, and since Sunday is Mother's Day, we want to give a, <laughs> a shout out to my mom, Debbie Blankenship. Mm -hmm. She definitely is an amazing Christian woman that leads our family. <coughs> She was a great yeah. mom, but she's an even better grandma to our kids. And so yeah. We love you, and we love our Valley View family, and we miss everyone, and we hope we see you soon. Bye. Happy Mother's Day. Bye. Mother's Day. Hi, I'm Alfreda Davis. Uh, a lot of you don't know me, uh, but I know a lot of you by voice. Uh, and... I know Spencer most of the time by voice. Sometimes he 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 does something different on me. Uh, but anyway, I miss uh, all those people that I knew. I miss uh, Lisa Horton. She uh, got me started. She made it possible for me to hear this on online. I. Uh, of course, uh, I ride the bus from here at uh, uh, Southwind, and I miss the people on the bus. Uh, and Randy, of course, he's, he jumps on that bus and gets everybody off. I miss Randy. Uh, I miss the ladies' class. Uh, I've got some cards and phone calls from... Risa called me Saturday, and I got a letter from uh, Danny and uh, Karen. Uh, I, I just really miss uh, the, the church there, and I, I, I miss going. Uh, it's everybody that that does know me are so good to me, and. Uh, but anyway, that's, I'm looking forward to getting back. I really am. Hey guys, we are so glad that Spencer asked us to uh, do the video. Um, we have been watching all the other videos and, and love seeing our family. Uh, we miss you guys. We can't wait till we get back together. Uh, we're so happy that um, now there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we can, uh, uh, kind of see this thing um, coming to an end, although that might look a little different. Uh, I can't wait to be able to get back and, and worship with uh, family members. We miss uh, getting to see all the kids. We miss uh, getting to, to uh, pick up all our kids and bring all our kids. We miss uh, getting to teach the second graders. Uh, we miss the FBI kids and holler at them from the uh, fellowship hall to come to class. Um, I can't wait till all of this um, is over so that we can all get back together again. Elliot, what do you miss? I miss all the people that hug me. Who is hugging you? <laughs> <laughs> you been funny here. And I miss Mr. Terry that gave me gum. And that's what I miss at church. Holly? I miss that sound, that roar of laughter and conversation as you walk in the church building. And it starts back up just as soon as the final amen is said. I miss Miss Parthy Gossett giving my girls hugs and telling them how special they are. I miss picking up Harper and seeing how much energy she has to come to church and picking up the Sanders kids, Berkeley and Maddox and Callie, and watching them give Miss Magdalene Walter big hugs. And I especially miss that midweek pick-me-up of coming to church and seeing everybody and holding us accountable for our actions. And I just am so ready to get back to that kind of normalcy. Sally, what do you think? I miss all my Bible class friends getting to go to potlucks. And I also miss getting to see the college kids after church is over. And I like getting to play with AJ and Grady in the, in the fellowship hall after church is over. That's what I miss. I can't wait till we can all get back together and bless the Lord through our song. Um, I don't know that our, 
our songs here are, are quite <laughs> blessing the Lord, but um, we are uh, trying the best that we can. Uh, can't wait to see you guys. I miss y'all and I love y'all. We love you. Bye. Bye. Hi, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I know this isn't the happiest of Mother's Days that you've ever had, but I want you to know that I look up to you and I admire you. And I really do think you're the strongest person that I know. I know we come from a long line of really strong women, but you have really shown me that you have the courage and the strength, um, especially during this just weird time. So I just wanted you to know that, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And I believe you have the strength. I know you don't think that you do, but all you got to be is strong enough. God's got the rest. I love you, Mom. I hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day. Good morning, Valley View. Uh, I'm Mark, Lisa. We got Griffin back there, AKA Junior. <laughs> and we got Lily right here. Uh, we miss you guys. Um, Just think about there's a big slogan you see a lot on TV and you see it uh, or hear it on the radio about we're all in this together. And I, I, th I think about Valley View as our spiritual growth. We're all in this together. And I, I, I miss Kelly's class on Sunday morning. and He does such a great job. And uh, you hear about people, you know, blessings and their victories and you hear about their challenges and you get to know people better. I miss that. I, I miss the auditorium. I miss the singing, Spencer's great lessons live. And uh, I look in front of me and I see Terry's, you know, mom and dad. I see Randy's mom and dad at their age and they're so, so faithful and that's so encouraging. And, uh, and they, they say it won't be long till we all get back together and we're ready. Lisa. Um, I would just like to add how blessed we were this week by uh, getting to go see the Holder family. We pray for them and we miss them and we were so encouraged to see them. And uh, we were also blessed seeing people going up and down the road that we haven't seen in a while and getting to wave to them. So uh, we miss every one of you. We love all of you and we can't wait to truck up that hill and see you all in person again soon. See you soon. About her taking care of me, me. providing us food, and providing me. us, you know, everything she provides for us. So is she a good cook? Yeah, she cooks really good stuff. Really good stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like what Sissy said. Providing us stuff. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day to my mom. And our Mimi. We thank you for being selfless, for always taking good care of us, and for the little surprises that you bring to us. Thank you for letting us swim in our pool. In her pool, and... Thank you for letting us make cookies <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. It's been a, what is it, 69 years now. Uh, you've been a good mother to me and my brothers, and we truly appreciate it, and we hope you have a very good Mother's Day. Thank you, Mom. Mothers at Valley View Church of Christ, a happy Mother's Day this year, May 10th, 2020. I'd like for everyone to please show your moms the love, the respect, and the honor that they deserve every day, but especially on this, their day. There'll come a day when you won't have another opportunity to help her celebrate her Mother's Day. Enjoy it, love them, respect them, and above all, honor them. I pray God brings us all back together very soon. May God bless each and every one of you and take care. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dana. I'm Caleb. I'm Josh. And I'm Chris. And we would like to welcome everybody to the Valley View Church of Christ Worship Services this morning. We miss everybody. We're not in-house. We're not in the congregation itself. We're having a worship remotely. And there are a lot of things that we miss about that. Lots of things that we missed. I'd say most of all for me is the people. I miss seeing everyone's face when I come through the door. I miss the hugs, the greetings. I miss feeling really comfortable, feeling like I'm home as soon as I get with our church family. 
I miss everything that my mom just said, but I also miss how the people are outgoing and friendly and just caring to everyone around me. I really miss my Bible class and all my friends at church. He misses something else, too. He misses Mr. Tony's hugs. He really misses Mr. Tony's hugs. And guys, I miss everybody. I miss the camaraderie. I miss everybody being together, one mind, one accord, headed and going to services for the same reason to get to heaven. I'm sure Spencer's gonna have a wonderful lesson shortly. I've got one more thing to add. The nation that we live in has set aside today as a holiday, Mother's Day. For those of you mothers out there, the ones that keep the families moving, the houses in order, the children straight, I'd like to wish you a happy Mother's Day. My dad has told me on numerous occasions that anytime you're dealing with any kind of issues with your children, there is nothing like a mother to be around. A lot of that rings true. So with that being said, mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. And on to you, Spencer. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trial, a famine and darkness and sore, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. As the trumpet calls, so lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation come. Today's scripture reading will be from James 5, 7 through 11. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently, waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and seen that what the Lord has finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I trust you were singing along or that was an awkward solo in Churches of Christ. Anyway, third pandemic passage, James chapter 5, gets really specific. Three directives that James gives his readers to help them accomplish in themselves what God would have them to accomplish in a very trying time. I had several people who posted me this picture on Facebook, this video of, uh, he's Chris Farley, I believe is his name from Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live. And it's like, this is going to be our first Sunday back when we're through with this mess. And he was coming down the aisle and he was giving high fives and everybody was just so glad to be together. And I thought that that's the way it's going to be. And then it dawned on me just in the last couple of weeks, that's, that's not how it's going to be at all. Uh, that we have to have this gradual returning, which kind of messes up the whole thing. Uh, but, but, but the this gradual thing, what I'm learning is our re-engagement is going to demand as much patience as, as our quarantining did. It's, it's just you're, you're chomping at the bit and you think things are getting back to normal, but it's got to be lots of restraint. And so it becomes a time uh, to demonstrate patience. It's still required and, and it still needs to be practiced. And I'm going to take this passage a little out of context. James chapter 5 is really about the rich and even your rich brothers uh, and sisters uh, in church with you who are systemically treating others poorly. And so you have a lot of poor Christians mistreated by rich people and they're held down. And you know what? It's never going to change. And James almost lets them know it's not going to change. This is the way it's going to be. And you're going to feel this persecution and this mistreatment for all of your life. 
And, and so this is not a great context for what we're experiencing necessarily, but what he is telling them is, in the middle of this difficulty you're experiencing that you can't fully change, you can change you. You can control you. And you can use this time to develop what God wants you to. What does God want you to do when you're in a very uncomfortable situation, not your own choosing, it's forced upon you? What does He want you to do with that? And that's where James enters in with James chapter 5. And he says it three times, be patient, one word. Actually, there's two words for patience in this passage. But it's the word that we dread, patience. I know you've said it. I know you've heard it. People will tell you, I'm never going to pray for patience again. Why? Because when I do, God gives me these circumstances that makes me develop it and learn it. Because here's the deal. Patience is not a miraculous gift. It is a spiritual fruit. And you know what fruit is? Fruit grows. It doesn't miraculously appear and just appear overnight. It takes time and it takes some work. And, but, but if you do it and you cooperate with the Spirit within you, you do produce patience. You see, as a Christian, it doesn't matter whether you like patience or not. It doesn't matter whether you want patience or not. That's what the Spirit in you is trying to produce. So whether you pray for it or not doesn't really matter. Your life is supposed to bear the fruit of this. And we think of it at traffic lights and we think of it at doctor's offices and waiting in line at stores. And it is frustrating. But you know what? As soon as that's over, at a really limited time, really, kind of a short amount of time, you go off and do whatever you want to and it becomes like a, just a momentary glint, right? But situations like we're in right now are times when you really seriously do need to develop patience. It doesn't matter what you plan or dream of or what you're hoping for. We are in what I call like a super slow motion culture at the moment. There's a place we're all picturing in our minds we want to go, but we can't get there fast. And some people about all this are hypersensitive. They post on Facebook every time somebody violates the recommendations. Lots of Facebook enforcers out there. Others are skeptical about all this and think that it's been overblown and thrown, uh, and we're all kind of handcuffed by it. Both sides are convinced the other side is wrong. And sometimes these, these two positions exist in the same couple in a marriage or the same family in a house or the same eldership in a church. What can you do in times like this? What's required for us to get along? There's no way to get away from this. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. And the virus is a le legitimate danger. And no matter what you think, the world has largely slowed down. And if we're starting again as we are, it's got to be really slow. You have to develop patience. Actually, no, you don't. You can grumble and you can raise your fist and you can raise your voice and you can look like a total baboon in public if you want to. Or if you're a child of God, you're supposed to use this time to develop, as James says, patience. It is a requirement, but more than that, it's a suggestion for what a godly person wants to do in this setting right now. So let's say it this way. This is an incredible opportunity to develop patience. It's said three times in this passage. There's two words that we're going to define here that are interchangeable. They don't really mean the same thing, but James is using them this way. Perseverance, it's hanging in here and not abandoning your values. It's hanging in. And then there's the word patience. And that means you're hanging in there, but you're acting properly while you do. There's a little bit of difference between these two, but you can put them together to make a, a whole picture. One means you need to stick around, and the other one, you need to stick around. You need to stick around faithfully. James tells us three things gives us three suggestions on how you can do this. Number one, watch the farmer. He said, I want you to watch the farmer. And I think he'd mean by this, watch those people around you who have learned this. Watch the people with occupations that require this uniquely. That could be a number of different things today, but I think where we live, the agricultural 
uh, industry is very prominent. We see it, and so it's a good example for us. From the farmer, he says, this is what you're supposed to learn. I want you to look at the farmer. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Precious fruit. He says there's, there's something he's got in his mind that's the end result, and he keeps that end result in his head. He's got to keep that because he's going to lose sight of that if he doesn't, right? And he's going to lose his mind and his patience. He keeps in mind at the end of this is this wonderful, valuable harvest. So the farmer, though, this is what he does. He does all he can do. He does all the work that he can do. His equipment is tended to. He gets the seed, he purchases it, and he prepares the land, and then he sprays it, and he does whatever he needs to do. He does whatever he can do. He does not just sit back and let God do it all. He wants to do something. But secondly, the farmer knows there's some things he has no control over at all. He has no say in it. Now what he says in the passage is, He's patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. Every time in the Old Testament early and late rains is mentioned, it's in a context of God's faithfulness. That's God's part. Now, we kind of have shortcuts today where you can bring in some water. But in his time, what he's talking about is, watch that farmer. He does everything he can do, but he also knows there's some things he needs that he has no say over. He has to wait. He knows about when it'll happen, but the timing is not in his own will. He has to just trust that God's going to come through for him. So do all that you can do and then trust God with the timing. And, and there's one really secret word to it. And he says, uh, I think, be patient about it until there, there is not, it's not just timing. That's not what this word is. It's purpose. He's got something he's got in his head. He keeps in his mind what the end goal is. You've got to wait until there is a time that it's going to end. It's not always going to be this way. And then you'll start over and do it again. The farmer does the next season. So he says, I want you to study people who are known for this. I want you to meditate and ponder on people who are known to be patient people. Farmer is one. Here's the second thing he says for us to do. He says, do not grumble against one another so that you won't be judged. But in verse 8, before this, he says, you be, again, he says, be patient. And then he says, establish your hearts. This is a weird phrase. It only appears a couple other times. And it's, it's an interesting, what does it mean to establish your heart? Use this time that you're waiting. Don't, don't be wasteful with your waiting time. Establish your heart. In other words, set your mind. Make some decisions you're going to stick with no matter what circumstances arise. No matter what happens in my life, there's some things that are set. There are some things that are absolute that I will never change. You keep living your life of faith. Listen, there's some times in life where you don't know what to do. Here's the truth. It's always right to do the right things. Always. There'll never be an occasion where doing wrong is right. Never. And so if you're sitting here going, well, maybe now with these circumstances, I need to suspend right and wrong. No. Establish your hearts. The time that you know when you really believe something is when a time comes when you start to wonder if you should. When you start doubting whether I need to really live this way or not, and you stick with it, that's when you know you believe it. It's not just something that you do as a habit that your mom and dad taught you. You do it because it's right. And you establish your heart. There's a couple of passages that say this. Uh, use this same phrase. I'm going I'm to give them to you. You'll see them on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. We're going to begin at verse 11, actually. Now may the, our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before the God and Father. Now he says God's going to establish your heart as you increase and abound in love for one another. No matter what the circumstances are, it's always the right thing to love your fellow brothers and sisters. It's always the right thing. Now, keep that in your head because we're going to go back to the context in a moment. 2 Thessalonians, again by Paul and again to the Thessalonians, he says the same phrase again. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. 
Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good word and work. Do you know how you establish your heart? By continuing to do good works and say true words. You put those things together. And you know that when times come that start testing and make you second-guessing your faith, but you stay with it, that's when you know your heart is established. You have grounded it in truth, and you're going to honor it. When it comes to the book of James, in this particular context, he says, establish your hearts so that you may not be judged. Right? Establish your hearts. Sorry, I skipped the line. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers. You know one of the ways that you show that your heart is established? You refuse to be gripey and grumbly about other people. You know the times when you're most often to do that? When you're stressed from the outside, when things are happening and it requires patience and you're losing your patience, one of the first things you start doing is grumbling and complaining about other people. Look at our culture right now and notice the polarization of people as they start striking out against other people. They are stressed, they are tense, they are worried, they're anxious about things happening, and they start reacting and speaking against other people. You establish your hearts and you say to yourself, I'm in a stressful moment right now and I will not compromise my faith and start talking in ways that I should not now. So you say to yourself, do not start, say to yourself, self, I'm not going to talk in ways I don't normally do about people just because I'm stressed. I need to hear that again. And if you'll pause for a moment, my wife is saying amen real loud right here. Just hear her. Do not, start talk, do not talk in ways you don't normally talk about people just because you feel tense. Establish your heart and decide, I'm not going to cross that line because I really believe this is true. For those going off to college, let me say it this way. Remember this. Everything's going to be new and everything's going to be different for a while and you will be tempted to change some things. And some of that's good and some of that's inevitable. But when you start thinking, do I really need to go to church? That's the wrong thought. Establish now that this is the right thing and every Sunday morning I'm able, I will be with the saints meeting together to worship the Lord. And no matter what circumstances change in my life, I will not change that. And even in the middle, and your family needs to be saying this, in the middle of a, of a pandemic right now where everybody's, all the rules are off, everything is suspended, on Sunday mornings we gather around and we worship together with our Valley View brothers. Why? Because we're establishing our hearts. This is a time that's holy no matter what else is going on around me. And when I go off to college and it's awful easy to hang around with friends who don't believe this and, ah, oh, is it really all that important? Yes, 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 it is. Establish your hearts. And that means I believe this no matter what situation arises, no matter what tension I'm under. I'm going to do this. Always attend worship. Always care about your speech and have the highest seasoned with salt, right? And grace. Always treat people with respect. And when you start wondering if you can lower that a little bit, you are compromising the heart that should be established. Never allow any situ situation make you second guess or compromise those things. To the time to hold on to this is right now. We're in an odd time, okay? And I think what we get from Thessalonians is this. As we love each other, as we do good works, and as we speak truth, even in the midst of a time where it's tempting not to, that's when you are making, you're, te you're teaching your heart who you really are. And this is who I am all the time. That's establishing your heart. We still worship. We still live out our faith commitments. We still do good works. I've been the beneficiary of this. You're going to see some pictures here in a, in a second. So we have a, a, an email goes out from church. Anybody needs masks? And all this time I've been thinking about masks, but I don't even have one. Stephanie Harris will make you one. So I, I go and I, I say, yeah, I'd like one. And she drives up that night in our driveway with five of them, all four of us plus Noah's fiance, who's not even there at the time. And she, one of them's Red Wolf, which is mine. 
and, and the others are matching outfits and stuff like that. And she makes masks because this is something she loves to do. And here's something I needed, but I didn't know where to get them anymore. And here she is providing that. She's doing good works in a time when, you know what, it'd be very easy to be very self-focused. The other night we're at home and we all have a sweet tooth. We all look at each other and say, is there any chocolate in the house at all? And there wasn't. It was really frustrating. It was going to be a long night. And then there's a knock at the door and it's Sutton Campbell. And he had, he had made cookies. You're going to see a picture. This is proof. He made cookies, and they were amazing. Some of them had little da dashes of cinnamon in it. I've never had chocolate chip cookies with cinnamon in it, but I will from the future. I'm telling when we make this. And I mean, within an hour, I was in a sugar coma, and it was wonderful. I was just basking in the glory of it because he thought of that, and he had a little note. He had a little note. He said, I just want you to know how encouraging uh, the service is and the videos that are at the front of it. And I know you and Matthew have something to do with it, and I wanted to bring you. I don't know if Matthew got cookies or not. I don't really care. I did. So I, I just, it's amazing that here's a kid who takes some of his time to do good works that blesses somebody else. And I'm telling you, it's not just cookies. It's not about cookies. It's the thought and the concern for your, your fellow believers. Um, establish your heart and don't allow... Uh, the special circumstances of any moment, the wind of change, to alter who you fundamentally are. This is a time to decide who you fundamentally are. What do I really believe? And you continue to act on it. A third thing, the last thing he says I think that matters to us, he doesn't say it this way, uh, but study your Bible. And I don't mean study it just like get out and read another chapter. I mean, find those places in Scripture that are most relevant to what you're experiencing that time and devour it and let it be a transformative reading. It affirms the Old Testament, not only as useful, but authoritative. Listen, this is the only time Job is ever mentioned in the New Testament. And this is what he says at the end of this particular section. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. You, it's a generic term, prophets, any of them. You can think of all of them. You can think of any of them that you want to, but he's assuming that you have some Old Testament knowledge, and so you start drawing on them. I'm thinking of Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah. They spoke the word of the Lord and often paid for it, often suffered because of it, but we admire them highly. We study them. We have VBSs over them. We have VeggieTales episodes on them because they're great stories. But it's not just stories to know for a Bible quiz either. It's a, he says, I want you to think of them. Do you... I want you to think of, think of what they suffered. Now, here's the funny thing. We admire them for that fortitude. We admire them for that strength. But I don't want to have to actually foster that myself. I kind of like looking at them from a distance and saying, oh, he's, he's arrived up there. But he's saying, you know what? These prophets are an example of what you might experience in life. There are moments when living the Christian life is going to be a challenge to you and you're going to be opposed by your circumstances or by people. And in those moments, call upon the prophets. Let them minister to you. Then he gets specific. You've lived in the earth. Oh, sorry, that's an Behold, we consider... Uh, those blessed who have remained steadfast. That's the word for per perseverance. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job. So now we get this reference to Job, and that's interesting because nobody in the New Testament mentions Job. It's just like he's back there, but nobody gives him any press. Why do you suppose it's time for James to bring out Job? Why is it appropriate for him to to bring that in and usher him as exhibit A or B in his argument. It's time to study Job, James says. It's time to look at him and realize it's not just some story out there. It's a story that's relevant to your life right this moment. And he says, there's two things I want you to get on Job. That's interesting. I've heard people say the, you had the patience of Job. Patience is not what Job is commended for here. And he's not exactly a patient guy. But a persevering guy, yes. Now that is true. He hangs on, right? And James is saying this is a great example of how believers are to hang in there. Now I'm going to tell you this, and, you, and if you know Job, you know this is true. Job was not a peaceful, pretty, 
stoic, persevering person. If you're looking for somebody who just stayed there in a meditative trance, you know, and just stayed there and did um for 40, year, 40 days while he suffered, that is not it. He's a loud, he's a, a shaken a fist at God, and he's a demanding God to answer him. But, but God looks at that and he put it in, our, in the Word so that we'll know that's what I mean by steadfastness. That's what I mean by perseverance. You hang in there. And if you complain, complain to Him. And if, you, if you're struggling, struggle with Him. Don't talk about God behind His back. Talk to God about Himself. Right in His face, He's big enough to handle it. And that's what perseverance looks like. You, your perseverance won't always be pretty, but Job proves that that kind of perseverance is honored by God. So the two things he does to apply this Job story... As he says, Behold, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have seen the steadfastness of Job. You have seen the purpose of the Lord. Job proves two things. Christians will undergo suffering, and they need to be steadfast when they're most confused. Christians will have to go through times where they have no idea what's happening, they have no idea what to do, but they hang on. It's going to happen. That's a good lesson from Job. It's authoritative for your ethical life. Second lesson is this. God has a purpose in that suffering. He has a thought in mind for what He wants you to do in this time. I'm not saying God caused it. I know He allowed it in the book of Job. Okay, He allowed this to happen. But He allows it to happen, and in His mind, He has something in store for Job in it. And whatever you undergo in your life, I want you to know God is allowing it, and He has something in mind for you. And He says, He goes on to say this, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. I want you to know that all along the way, God is compassionate and merciful. Job isn't just a story. It's an admonition for believers to use their own challenging times to understand something deeper and better about God than you ever did before. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. It's something useless for you. Could it be that certain parts of Scripture become more relevant and applicable to your life at suffering times than at any other time? That's why he ushers in Job. And this is a time in our lives, if you're going through difficulty and you're experiencing a lot of anxiety, find those passages like Job that allow you to glean from it things that will help you in your own time. It's pandemic passage number three. And I think what this value is for James chapter five is it's practical. While you wait for the world to get back to normal, as you're having to go slower than you want to be, First of all, ponder the examples of patience you see around you. Now, he had the farmer, and the farmers are good ones, but you know people in your own life who have mastered patience and you admire them. What is it about them that make them admirable to you? What is it that you can glean from them? Other than just saying, hey, man, I admire you for your patience. What is it about them? It's worth studying. Second, establish your heart. Decide right now some things that are absolutely and always true and you are going to stick with them no matter what changes in your life. This is the time to establish your heart. There's a lot of beliefs that we have while the light is shining. And when the light goes out, you have to really decide whether you believe them or not. And that's the moment when either you believe it and you show it or you don't and it's all a game. And I'm telling you right now, we're deciding. We are. We are demonstrating whether we really believe this faith or not. We establish our hearts. And thirdly, study the Bible transformatively, especially those passages that are most relevant to your situation. James says to us, this is the time where you must learn patience and perseverance. And that's why this is provided. Don't, don't waste this great chance. And if you do this well, it'll serve you well in the future too. Thanks for joining us. Be healthy and stay safe. Now at the close of our service, we'd like to
take this opportunity to remember a few folks that are not doing as well at this time as others, that are having some physical infirmities, dealing with some accidents and some personal losses. So we'd like to pray for those people at this time. So would you join me in the shepherd's prayer? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of this day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have the opportunity to come to you in prayer, to address you as our Father. We count it so worthy to be known as thy children. Heavenly Father, we ask at this time you continue your blessings upon those medical professionals that are working throughout the United States and throughout the world, that are right on the front lines, that are in, sometimes endangering themselves and putting their families at risk to take care of others. Heavenly Father, we also ask you to be with those, especially of our number here at Valley View, that are, that are involved in that profession. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings to continue also on those that are, that are the essential workers that are making sure that people have food to eat and the, the necessary supplies to be able to survive at this time, during this time of this pandemic. We ask your blessings to be upon them and we ask you to protect them. Heavenly Father, we have many of our number that are dealing with various health issues and are sick at this time. We'd like to, Heavenly Father, we'd like to mention those. We ask your blessings to be upon our sister Doris Nichols and her husband Bob who are not doing well at this time and have some health issues. We ask your blessings to be upon our brother Gail Holder and Miss Brenda. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the, the life that Gail has, has lived for thee and as an example to us. Heavenly Father, we ask you to continue to be with that family. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings to be upon Autumn Kirtner, whose father, John Simpkins, passed away this past week. We ask your blessings to be upon that family as they're dealing with this loss at this time. We also ask you to be with John Singleton, who's in the NEA hospital dealing with some health issues. We ask your blessings to be with John Pruitt and Ann Dawson as they are in the Encompass Rehab Hospital dealing with dealing with recovery from some of their serious injuries and serious illnesses. Heavenly Father, we ask a special blessing to be upon our sister Iris Swindle who fell off a ladder and has, has torn her ACL and meniscus and will be having surgery in the next couple of weeks. We ask your blessings to be upon her and be upon Brother Glenn as he tends to her. We, th we thank you for the surgery that Hansel Hall had uh, to pre repair a leak in his brain, Heavenly Father, but we know that he's continued still to be in some pain. We ask you to, to comfort him. We thank you as well for the successful surgery of Johnny Sutterfield, Pat Qualls' great nephew. Heavenly Father, we ask a blessing that you would be with Billy Wills' dad, who had to make an emergency trip to the NAA hospital this past week, and also with Billy John, Sandy Everhart's dad, who was in the hospital this week as well. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for all the good things that you've blessed us with. Heavenly Father, we, we can't wait to be back with each other soon, to see each other's face. Heavenly Father, we, we pray that, that this virus, this disease, that, it'll be, that we will find a, 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 a cure or at least uh, have a, a, a flu shot for it so that we can continue to uh, come back and return to life as normal. Heavenly Father, be with us. Comfort us, protect us, forgive us of our sins, strengthen us when we fail thee. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.